Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Duran. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Trending Vegas. We're gonna do things a little differently. The last two episodes, we've been talking nonstop about coronavirus on social media. It seems to be flooding all of our platforms. I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to the experts here in Las Vegas about what we're facing and maybe what we can expect going forward as the state hopefully starts to reopen eventually when things are safe. I'm joined now by Dr. Luis Medina Garcia, who is the infectious disease doctor at UMC. I'm one of the ID doctors there. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. What has this time been like for you? Whew. Well, a lot of learning. Um, this virus is something that we've been dealing with for about the past three months. This virus specifically, coronaviruses become, belong to a large family of viruses, but they're usually not deadly. Mm -hmm. So out of the whole coronavirus family, you had two instances where they made people sick enough to die, in this case, the third instance, and a lot of the knowledge is new. So there's a large amount of information that needs to be processed, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges for me specifically, to be up to speed with all the information. And then, you know, learning a lot about the public health aspect of it and how hospital systems work and how everybody really needs to play along to achieve the goal, which is keeping people safe. Absolutely, and one of the things that we've done and the governor has done to keep people safe is stay-at-home orders in, in terms of social distancing and closing non-essential businesses. How do you think social distancing has helped here in Southern Nevada? It has definitely helped. So the projections initially by the, the big universities that did the modeling on where we were gonna be had much higher numbers of patients that became infected in Nevada and a much higher number of deaths. So luckily, we have been successful in preventing the spread of the disease, uh, not completely, but mm -hmm. you know, slowing down the, the speed of it. And then certainly, we have seen a lot less mortality than was initially predicted. But I can tell you that that is in large part because of everybody's efforts in social distancing and staying at home and doing everything they can to keep this community healthy. What do you believe society is gonna look like as we go forward? I think there's a lot of unanswered questions and you know, we're thinking about Raider Stadium. Are we gonna be able to go to football games eventually down the road? Are we gonna be able to sit side by side? Are classrooms gonna be able to have 25 kids in one classroom? Do you have any idea what social distancing should look like as we start to roll open? So I think the new normal cannot be predicted quite yet. Uh, and that's because opening back society as a whole uh, will have to be done in stages, in my opinion. And that also has to be tied into our public health uh, ability to test people, to isolate people, uh, to keep those that are vulnerable safe. So at least in the, in the next few months or perhaps a year or so, uh, people will still need to social distance. People probably will be wearing masks for some time uh, until you can create the mechanisms where through a public health strategy, you keep those that are presumed to be infected or highly infectious from the society at large to keep the ones that are vulnerable safe. Right. So how is that gonna pan out exactly is very difficult to predict, but it should be done slowly and it should be done responsibly. It definitely is gonna be interesting to see how businesses go forward in terms of teleworking or distance learning for school-aged children and to see how that works. And, and that's going to be part of the future. So in the area of medicine, uh, the large amount of practices in town and across the country have transitioned to telehealth services, mm -hmm. uh, including ourselves. And teaching through school has been done through web-based uh, teaching. Uh, a large part of our workforce is doing telework. And I, I'm sure that's true across many industries. So that's, that's gonna be part of the future. Hopefully, you know, we'll start getting more data that we can act on. To, to open these things up responsibly. And, and by that I mean, you have to take care of the vulnerable because the vulnerable could be one of our loved ones. Right, and we don't know who the vulnerable are in this situation. Exactly. So you have uh, the older population that is more vulnerable to severe disease, 
but we have seen plenty of cases in the United States of perfectly healthy young athletes that also become very sick. Right. So the responsible thing is to do it as carefully as possible with uh, the data that you know is from sound science. Will we develop eventually this herd immunity and be able to go back to way, I mean a new normal, but is there such a thing as a herd immunity with something like this? So at some point uh, we want that to happen. Uh, vaccines hopefully will help us get there, but it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, just for the context of it, this is the fastest that a vaccine candidate has come to clinical trials, meaning testing in humans, uh, and that's largely because they built on the scientific work they had done for the previous coronaviruses. But before you mass administer a vaccine to the population at large, you have to make sure that it is a safe vaccine because otherwise right. the benefit that you can get from vaccinating people will be erased by side effects. So you have to make sure that the risks are worth it. Do we know, and it's a question we're seeing all over social media, do we know if you have the virus, if you can get it again? So we don't know for sure. There's been some reports where patients initially test positive, then they get better physically, are tested again and test negative, and then they get sick again and test positive again. But the, the prevailing theory in the scientific community is not that they have acquired a new infection, but that they had an incompletely suppressed virus, meaning that same virus that right. they had, their immune system was able to control it, and then it got out of control again, and wow. then you control it again. So they think it's a reactivation of the same virus that they had as opposed to a new infection. Okay, so that's interesting that there is actual cases of it going and coming and going, but and, we don't and know if it's the same virus. most of these things are, are case reports, which means, you know, right. it does not happen enough to actually call it a thing. Wow. But well, What's it like to try to keep up with all this information and try to stay on top of it in terms, and also treat patients accordingly? Very challenging. Um, so some practices that have large groups of infectious disease physicians have actually designated one of those doctors from that group to just review the literature oh. because it, it changes so rapidly that it's just impossible for you to give patient care and then be up to speed with all the new developments. Uh, in our case, you know, we rely heavily on our colleagues and then the School of Medicine, the residents, everybody's involved in the science of it. Our pharmacists are amazing. Uh, so we really make it a team effort to keep up to the latest and greatest of, of the science from this. Well, one last question before we go, and I know I've yelled at my son and three-year-old numerous times saying, don't jump off of that or don't, I don't want to take you to the emergency room. We can't go. Is that true? I mean, what are your thoughts on that in terms of them so, being... So you can go. Right. Uh, if you are in an emergency, you should call 911. And we have the ability to take care of you at UMC and all the local hospitals. Uh, what we ask is that if you are feeling sick with a fever and cough and signs or symptoms of COVID, uh, to stay at home if you can. Call your doctor's office. They can help you over the phone, talk to you about your symptoms. Uh, but if you develop shortness of breath, which is the most concerning symptom of this disease, then to go to the hospital immediately. We are not telling people to not go to the hospital, just to be reasonable, and if you don't think this is an emergency, don't go to the hospital. Right, be reasonable. But my, my advice on that sense is, if it makes you very worried, you should go to the hospital. Right, I guess the fear as a parent is, am I putting my child and myself in harm's way if I go into a hospital where there are COVID cases? Right, and that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a concern that it everybody is. has. It is a concern. But if the nature of the emergency is such that it could put your life at risk, absolutely. Then that's a risk that you need to take. Right, absolutely. So, okay. Emergencies come first, <laughs> COVID or no COVID. Doctor, anything else you want to tell the public before we uh, go? Just to thank them for their efforts um, in cooperating with their stay-at-home orders. We understand that it is an impossible task for people sometimes. We understand that it is very difficult and it requires a large amount of sacrifice. But if we want our community to get back to the productive and and uh, amazing society that we are, we all have to do our part. Okay. So thank they, you again. Yeah, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. All right, we'll be right back.
Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Welcome back, everyone. Well, the school year took a turn when we found out the kids would not be going back to their actual campuses to finish out the school year. They've had to do distance learning, and now people are wondering what that means for next school year. I'm joined by CCSD Superintendent Dr. Jesus Jara. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jara. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you for having me. Well, first, Dr. Jara, if you could just tell us how everyone has been adjusting. This is definitely a scenario nobody was anticipating back in January or February. You're right on. I mean, first of all, let me just, uh, our teachers have been doing a phenomenal job. Our entire staff are just really moving uh, from a brick and mortar face-to-face -face instruction, kids coming in, getting on buses, going to lunch, breakfast, uh, to really within a week, not leaving your home, our educators and everybody just really trying to do the best we can to, to provide a, a a quality education for our students to the best way possible. And it's been challenging. We've, we've done a lot of great things. We've, you know, we've had to go back and make some adjustments, but we're learning every single day. This is not something that, you know, not, nobody could ever imagine or even prepare for. Well, obviously there are hundreds of thousands of students you have to reach throughout your school district. What has been the challenges you all have faced to actually reach out to students or come in contact with students during this time? You know, we have a very diverse population, very diverse community uh, for students. And, and really, uh, the challenge has been we, we, we are missing some students that we haven't been able to connect. And, and for some part has been, you know, updating, updating their, their contact information in school. So now we're getting more into the weeds, into more into the details to find kids and find our students. So last week we started deploying our wellness, our wellness checks. Um, to make sure that our, our social workers and our, our, our staff was going out to check in individually uh, face to face, uh, you know, in, in to try to make contact with our students. But then also the piece that that's been really the biggest challenge that we continue to talk about. And, and last week, yesterday, we, we were part of the Council of Great City Schools that released, um, you know, a, a, a bill or actually a request of Congress to add money uh, for a stimulus package for really for our school system, that money that comes directly to really try to address the digital divide. $172 billion request for urban schools across America for the digital divide for technology for us to be able to get, um, you know, instructional online services for our students. And we can go ahead and talk about that. You guys have been able to give out some Chromebooks to students. How many have you guys been able to give out? We had about 200,000 devices. We have about 80,000 80, devices. as is the last number that we've been able to deploy. And we got a, our goal is to get to over 100,000 within the next week. And who does that go out to first? High schoolers first? Um, so we started with our seniors. Then we went down into our high schools, then rolled down into our middle schools. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we started with our elementary schools as well. So our schools, again, coming in, pitching in, doing a great job to make sure that our children um, have the technology available at home. And does this include Wi-Fi access? What about the students that do not have that kind of Wi-Fi access? You know, we've been in contact and in communication with Cox Communication and some of the other um, internet providers that we were trying to make sure that you're right, because it doesn't do us any good by just giving the student a, uh, a device without Wi-Fi connectivity. So right. one of the things that we are partnering in, and Cox has been a great partner uh, in opening up Wi-Fi connectivity for for our families we're continuing to do that and i know a lot of the other ones have you know had the partnership where it's a two month free and then it goes into 995 a month moving forward a connect to compete program um so we we have a variety of programs that uh, we've been able to to share with our um, with our partners with, and then also with our families. I know a lot of people, especially parents, wondering what the next school year is going to look like. I know you probably don't even have some of the answers yourself, but from what you know right now, what will next school year look like? As I mentioned to the Board of Trustees, 
at our last board meeting, we put together a working group. Uh, we're finalizing the members of our working group here locally, obviously our transportation, our facilities, also our teachers are gonna be included, our support professionals as well, our, our building principals, because ideas were all coming all over the place. So I wanted to bring in a group um, to say, what is instruction gonna look like for our children? Whether we come back to school face-to-face, -face, this is, is stagger time, you know, how do we do lunch? How do we do passing? Uh, you know, so all of these different um, criteria and all these different uh, guidelines that we have to take into account. Do we move seats six feet away from one another, but then how do we pass uh, when the bell rings? Is it going to be a little bit obviously going to be different for high school than it is for middle schools and for elementary schools? So our, um, a variety of, of ways that we're looking at now, um, you know, and, and also take into account we we're also thinking one of the things that I've had um, some some thoughts of, you know, there's some families that may just really enjoy this distance learning education. So do they do they stay with this process and, and really move into, you know, pushing the district to think differently? Superintendent, I don't know if the correct word is an eye opener, but I would assume that the district has learned a lot through this process about what it takes to distance learn. Is there going to be some sort of backup plan or requirement of teachers to have distance learning planning in case something like this were to happen again? One of the things that we're looking at, um, and obviously, and, and we're been, we've been in constant conversation in, uh, since uh, day one with our with our teachers union, with CCEA, great partners that we've been working with, with them. Because it may just not be just a, a pandemic. It may just be this is this is really the way of the world. Uh, how do we think differently? One of the things that we need to make sure that we do for our teachers is that how do we provide them with support to provide online learning for our kids? So, uh, which is one of the things that we're, we're preparing and we're going to start releasing some professional learning, working with our teachers union uh, to make sure that we provide them with the resources and the tools that they need in order to provide instruction virtually, online, blended. Um, we have to be, be ready to respond whether it's another pandemic, whether it's what happens in the fall. Um, so right. we're, we're putting all these plans in place to be ready to go either way, um, you know, not only to open up the school year, but then also um, to be ready to respond um, in the fall or other ways. You know, so often in times like these, everyone's budgets take a huge hit. Do we know where the school district's budget is going to be a shortfall number? Are you guys gonna have to lay off any teachers or maybe not? fill some positions that needed to be filled? You know, right now, one of the things that we're looking at is obviously we, the, the, the budget for this fiscal year, we, we submitted um, some po a potential uh, return because obviously state grants and different things that money we didn't spend. Um, so that really helped a little bit. One of the things that we're looking, the state superintendent for public instruction mentioned to all superintendents that the first week of May, uh, we will have a better picture on the budget. So we're waiting on that. Uh, but then we're also making plans uh, on our end um, to try to speculate, but we're going to wait until the state provides the numbers and then we can move into a direction as to see what the final decision is from the state leaders. But then also looking and counting on, on what the federal stimulus money that's coming in uh, for not only education, uh, but for jobs and different, different um, opportunities here for us to be able to really uh, balance our budget. Well, this has obviously been a learning curve for parents out there and students. I know that I've taken on the role as kindergarten teacher, something I was not prepared for. But what does the mindset of parents and students need to be? Some people maybe consider this a nice little break, but distance learning could really possibly be part of our future. So what does the mindset of everyone need to be as we go into next school year? One of the things that I'll tell you uh, for our for our parents, I said, you know, be patient. We didn't get everything right, uh, but I'm gonna tell you, we tried every decision we made was in the best interest of our students. Uh, communicate with our families. If you haven't heard from us, please, please, please contact us and let us know where you are. One of the things that really keeps me up at night is some of the students that we haven't been able to reach. Um, so please do that um, and let us know where you are. We're really concerned. One of the things that, um, you know, our teachers are working so hard to really move into a new way of education. Um, so, you know, be, be understanding and flexible. We're doing the best we can, um, you know, and be a great partner as they normally are. Anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Jara? No, that was it. Thank you so much, Melissa. 
Thank you so much, Superintendent Jara. And when we come back, we're going to take a closer look at a local business that is bringing some amazing recipes straight into your kitchen. That's coming up. Stay with us. New York is the canary in the coal mine. What happens to New York is going to wind up happening in your city and in your community. We are going to fight every way we can to save every life that we can. We are all first responders. Your actions can either save or endanger a life. Job one has to be save lives. That has to be the priority. Welcome back everyone. While businesses around Las Vegas have had to find creative ways to possibly stay open and still engage their customer base, one place or one website, I should say, secretburger.com has done just that and found, uh, found innovative ways to keep customers coming in and keeping their chefs connected to their customer base. I'm joined by the founder of Secret Burger, Jolene Manina. Thank you so much for joining us, Jolene. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about Secret Burger and the background to this business. Well, Secret Burger is all online, so it's secretburger.com, and uh, the site was designed for um, chefs to be really creative. So consumers go there to discover and reserve unique culinary experiences uh, and off-the-menu dishes um, before they sell out. So these are off-the-menu dishes, so secret dishes where I'm assuming Secret Burger comes into play the title. That's right. It's more about the secret than the burger. So it can literally be anything. But really, we, we push the chefs to do something that they've never served before. So that's where it gets very exclusive uh, and kind of creates that FOMO for guests. So you create this secret menu, so to speak. The consumer purchases a ticket for that one day. Mm -hmm. They go in, they get to experience this secret menu item but also it really helps the business in general for those who are participating because the consumer is introduced to so many other things on the menu. Absolutely. They've got a personal connection already with the chef before they come in because they're getting a dish that's unique and there's usually a story behind it. And then, yeah, we're driving the restaurants, um, you know, prepaid covers to come into the restaurant to experience this dish. And then uh, the majority will, you know, order a glass of wine or an appetizer or even bring a friend. Even though that friend may not be able to enjoy that dish, um, they can come in with, with a large group as well. So the additional spend is, uh, has been very beneficial for the restaurants. Before COVID-19 became an issue in our community, did you see or did the chefs you work with see a lot of repeat customers thanks to their introduction from secretburger.com? Absolutely, absolutely. We got a lot of testimonials from the restaurants that they did see a lot of the repeat business. So tell me a little bit about what has had to shift now that we are in this middle, the middle of this pandemic. We knew that our platform could help chefs uh, with anything that they wanted to sell as a pre-order, uh, which works out really great for the chef because it removes that risk. The chef knows exactly what they have to purchase and prepare in advance. And so um, chatting with, with a lot of the chefs in town and Nina Manchester specifically uh, from Forte Tapas, she came to me and she said, hey, you know, all the chefs are getting online, they're doing these virtual classes, but I, I, I really want to do this, but I'd also like to provide a cooking kit so that the people at home can prepare the meal with me. Can you help me? Can we facilitate this? And I was like, absolutely, this sounds amazing. I'm going to buy your first ticket. So it was a brilliant idea. I mean, it was a way for restaurants who are still um, open, doing delivery, to put together a cooking kit of ingredients they're already prepping, they already have in-house, and to pre-sell those, driving them, um, you know, customers, but then the customer picks up the kit at the restaurant and then they tune in either that same day or the next day to social media and actually prepare the dish with the chef. It's been a huge hit. It allows the chef to engage with their fans, create new customers, drive them business and know exactly what they have to purchase and prepare. So there's no waste involved for the chef. I mean, and you have some great chefs in Southern Nevada that are participating. Can you name some of the restaurants and chefs that are part of your program? Absolutely. So um, this is Nina Manchat from Forte. This will be her sixth week doing this. Uh, we also have James Trees from Esther's Kitchen. Uh, his sold out really quickly. That is this Wednesday. 
Dan Cromer from Other Mama is doing a sashimi and ceviche class. That's Friday. Uh, Saturday, Vincent Rotolo from Good Pie. You get to, to make a stromboli with him. Uh, on Sunday, we've got a double header. We have Bryce Krausman from DW Bistro, and he's going to do his his uh, chicken flautas that is one of his staple dishes at DW. And then Nina Manchev is also going to do another one at three o'clock. She's going to do stuffed peppers. Uh, and then Tuesday, uh, we've got a virtual wine tasting with garages from downtown. Um, and so and most of these guys are going to be doing them every week because they have, you know, they have the time to do the videos right yeah. now. So, what's yeah. Been the, what's been the feedback from those who are purchasing tickets right now and taking the items home to follow along with the chef. I know that I have several coworkers who do this and they just rave about it. They love it. They think it's so much fun. They still feel connected to a community. We're seeing the engagement on social media because they're doing the class, but then they're also going online to show their creations. You know, you're so satisfied at the end of these classes, you've created these amazing dishes that you thought you'd never do before. So that social media engagement is also really helping out the restaurants, but it's it's been very positive. Everyone loves it. And there's a lot of, I get a lot of thank you notes every day for for being able to facilitate this, you know, for the community. So just the logistics of things, how much does a ticket cost? Does it depend on the restaurant? And how far in advance should people be looking to purchase? Most of the tickets will go live almost a week before the event. Some are only four or five days right now. So they're, they're going up rather quickly. And uh, we've had everything from $15 to $55, depending on the kit. Some kits are individual, some are per two, some are adding a complete meal. So like for uh, Esther's Kitchen this week, you're making the pasta with James, but he also included in bread service and a salad and dessert. So when you're finished making the pasta, you've got this full meal. And then um, a lot of the chefs are also doing add-ons. So right now, you know, just to help increase their sales and to get you more product there, you can add on meatballs or you can add on a ball of wine or you can add on a cocktail kit or mixers um so we're seeing a lot of people not just buy the kits but also buy these you know extra add-ons okay well such a great idea i'm excited to try it um, where should people go if they want more information go to secretburger.com they're all listed on the front page under las vegas thank you so much and good luck to you and to all the chefs and restaurants participating with you guys thank you guys so much for spreading the word we really, we really appreciate it and thank you for watching at home. Remember, you can get in on the conversation. Just follow us at City of Las Vegas using the hashtag TrendingVegas. We'll see you next time. Stay safe, everyone.